Hello there and welcome back. I'm Martin and today on Daddy Roll the One, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about my campaign prep and session prep for the campaign that I'm running for my daughter. Uh, as a reminder, she and her friends are 14 now. They were you know, between 10 and 11 when we started almost three years ago, so it's still going. I'm running a 1981 basic Moldvay D&D rules. So if you're not familiar with what that is, you're going to want to check out my video on that system here. So last time I talked about how I added a new player to the group, uh, which was really kind of fun. So it was the younger sister of one of my daughter's friends who uh, had had been kind of watching. She's only a year younger and wanted to uh, jump into the game. And so uh, I talked about how I we went of about inviting her and making sure that everybody was comfortable with it. Uh, but she, everyone was, and so she continued with the game. So at the end of the last session, the player characters, so that's my daughter and two, two of her friends who all three were playing uh, elves in basic D&D Moldvay edition. Elf is a class, not a race. So you have three elves. One of her friends was playing a thief. And then the dad of one of the players was playing a cleric. So there are five of them. And then the new player, which is the younger sister of one of the elf players, she was playing a fighter. So they've been captured by some goblins and they wake up in uh, this goblin cell. And at the end of the last session, they had broken out of the cell, but then realized that, you know, they were under under dark and they had no equipment or weapons. And also they have no idea how to get out of where they are. And now as a reminder, also in Mold Bay Basic, there's no dark vision Elves do have something called infravision, which is a very limited source of heat vision. And I allow it a little bit. But in this particular case, I said, look, you're underground. Everything's cold and wet. So nothing's radiating heat. If you do come across something that radiates heat, I'll let you know. But for the most part, um, your infravision is not going to do you any good. Now, why am I doing that? Am I trying to nerf my players? No. What I'm trying to do is make being in the dark an exciting part of the game. If everybody has dark vision, then being underground in the dark is pointless. Then, then you know, there's there's no anxiety that's going to come from that. And you can't use that as a way to kind of add tension to your game. And I wanted to do that. So they needed to get out. So again, uh, as a reminder, also, I'm borrowing a lot of these ideas from the Dungeon Craft YouTube channel by Professor Dungeon Master. And so he uh, did a similar thing in his game. Everyone's human. So there was no dark vision. So um, and what he did and it's something that I copied from his idea was this concept that they are in this goblin cave system, but because they can't see where they're going and they can't map it, they don't have a map. They have no sense of direction. When you're underground, you're going to get very turned around because you don't have any points that you can use like stars or mountains or anything like that, where you can get your bearings from a distance. So they have no concept of what direction they're going. And so what Professor Dungeon Master did was use these little discs with numbers written on them. And then he flipped them over and kind of put them in the middle of the table and let the players um, grab, grab those to figure out what rooms they were in. Well, I did something similar, but what I did was start taking notes on the 10 rooms that I wanted to have in my goblin caves. So this is my pre-planning notebook with my <laughs> terrible handwriting, but this is where I take my notes like after dinner or, you know, sometimes if I'm just sitting at my desk, like on a really long phone call or something where I don't have to contribute that much, I'll, I'll jot a note down if I remember it. Um, but what I decided to do was use playing cards. So one of my friends had given me this deck of cards, uh, for Christmas one year, just as kind of like a, you know, a little thank you gift, I invited him over to a holiday party that we were having. And uh, this deck is called Faye. And it just has these really kind of neat designs, especially when you get to the, um, uh, you know, the face cards. So I really like this. So what I did was I had 10 rooms. So I picked out ace through 10 and then the jack and queen. And I said the jack is an 11 and the queen is a 12. So I had those for each of the 12 rooms. And then I had, uh, I threw the Joker card in just as a fun thing. So that's something the professor didn't do, but I added it to my game. So the idea was if they drew the Joker card, that was going to be a little benefit that they would get. And I would have to make that up on the fly. So I didn't create a um, random table for a beneficial effect because I wanted it to be relevant to what was happening at the time. And I'll show you how I would have done that. Had they drawn a, a Joker, they did not. But had they, I, I'll tell you about that. But what I did was go around. So I had the cards out. And, uh, you know, so I kind of turned them, you know, upside down. 
And I went to each player and said, okay, draw a card. And whatever card you draw, that's going to be key to the room that you're going to end up in because you don't know where you're going. Okay. So, um, and this was allowing me to, to interact with the players. So when I DM, I stand up. I never sit down. I'm not hidden behind a screen. I have a dice box where I roll my dice, but I have my notes in front of me that nobody can really see because, again, they can't read this writing. I mean, I can barely read it myself. So, as they went through the rooms, I would go up to each player individually and say, okay, draw, you like draw your card. And then when they were done, that would put it back in the deck and I'd shuffle. And then we'd go through that room and then I'd get to the next player and say, okay, draw. It created so much tension with them. They were so anxious about like their hands would shake when they were going to pull the card out because they just, you know, they were so afraid of getting like a crazy room that they didn't want to be in. Or like, what if they go back to a room they had been in before, which did happen a couple of times. And they were really trying hard to avoid that. And so I really like this idea. Um, I could have just had them roll a die for it, like a 12-sider die. That would have been easy. What I liked about doing it this way, though, was, again, I was getting that one-on-one -on -one interaction. I'm right up in their face, having them draw this card. And, and then, like, they would all kind of crowd around to see, like, what card got drawn. So that's how I use these cards. And again, it's just a fun way that you can add some more kind of physical one-on-one -on -one interaction with your players rather than just sitting behind a screen and rolling dice all the time, okay? So um, obviously you can't really do this if you're playing virtually. So again, in that case, then just roll a D12 and have each player roll in turn, and that would work fine. Um, I just like doing it this way because I prefer playing in person. So I was going around to have them draw these cards. So I had written out what my rooms were in here, and I had the prison cells themselves. I had a guard room, I had a kitchen, barracks, temple. So a lot of these, again, are coming from Professor Dungeon Master's channel. And um, I had a mushroom cave. I had a laboratory. I had a scholar. And so I had all those rooms. And then I started talking about, okay, well, how are we going to get out? Like, what's going to happen when they get out? And I made a note here that I wanted some hallucinations happening when they went into the mushroom cave. And so I made a note for that. And I made, and then I made them note on like all kinds of different hallucinations of things that could happen. So I had started jotting them down here and then uh, I down at the bottom and then I ran out of room. So I started to put them up here. So those are kind of my notes that I took for that particular part. And then um, I had more for that mushroom cavern and like what was going on in there. Okay. So again, we've talked about before, this is my pre-planning notebook. Then I transfer everything over here to this notebook. So this is going to cover the second and third sessions for this group. So I talked about how I'm using the maps that Professor Dungeon Master uses. So I don't want to show too much because this is something that he offers on his Patreon. But you can see that I keyed each room here uh, to something on the map. And one of the things that I did for each room, because I knew the player characters couldn't see, was I wrote down descriptions of what smells and what sounds they would hear and smell, you know, obviously, as they got close to the room, uh, to that particular cave, so that if they ended up drawing that number again and accidentally going back, they would have cues as they were getting close to say, wait a second, we smell sulfur and we hear bubbling liquid. We must be getting close to the, the laboratory again. And whether they want to go back there or not, then they would have a choice because they had been there before and they could identify it from the sounds and the smells. So that was, again, another way that I was using to help kind of keep the um, immersion of the game and get them really involved in using all sights and sounds and senses that you would have um, when you're underground and you can't see. So you've got smells and you've got odors. Now, if you've seen my video on uh, where I reviewed Veins of the Earth, a lot of the ideas that I took for how to key my rooms here and how to describe them and uh, again, give them that, those different senses. A lot of it, uh, at least I was inspired by that book. And so highly recommend that you watch that video to see that review on, on how that book could help you do underground adventuring. So I keyed that room and then, uh, I, well, I had each room keyed. And then another thing that I did for the second session, so I had it planned where I thought they might get out of the caves by the end of that session, they did not. So they ended up accidentally going back to several rooms because they kept redrawing the same cards. And so things started to get really dicey. But one of the things that was interesting was that, so if you remember when I added that new player character, the fighter character, I'd given her um, a little bit of a background. One of the things that I mentioned was that she had the spear that she'd named, she called it Destiny. And I said like, that was her love. So I did a video on the loves, hates and fears of each character. And I had them tell me one thing that they that they 
um, love, hate, and fear for their character. And I have that written down here in the back of my uh, notebook so that I remember to use it like during the game. But um, so her love was her spear. Her love was was her spear destiny. And so she was like, I don't want to leave without getting that back, which I thought was really cool because she was a brand new player. And this was not her character that she created. It's something I gave her and I gave her that line. But she remembered that it was on there. And so she she was very adamant that she needed to get her spear back before they left these caves. So partly what they were doing was looking for the exit, but the other thing they were looking for was where their equipment and weapons were. And a lot of the characters also, the players, at least they wanted to do that because they felt like they'd spent all this time buying all this equipment and they didn't want all that starting money to go down the drain because it was taken. So they were kind of, they were with her on wanting to get the equipment back, but she was like, I am not leaving. So they go through, they eventually did find their equipment and uh, in one of the barracks, so they re-equipped themselves and then they were on their way out and it was getting late. We were playing outside at this time. It was fall and, um, you know, the sun was going down and it was getting really hard to see. And I, I had my notebook out. I was like, I really can't see it. So I was like, guys, we're going to have to call it. And uh, they're like, no, add more candles. Get some. And I was like, no, I think it's time. Let's have dinner. And, you know, your parents are on your way over. So we stopped right before they did the chase scene to get out. So that was one of the things that happened was they had... Um, in order to escape, they had exposed the, um, there was a plague doctor in, in his plague doctor costume living in the goblin caves. And I had mentioned this, and again, this is an idea I took straight from Dungeon Craft, so I didn't come up with this idea, but how my players handled it was, it worked this way. So he's crazy. And I had written in my notes, like the guy's nuts, and it's going to come up later in the game. He's a recurring villain at this point, but um, he had, uh, offered to lead them out, but he wanted them to work with him to basically help the goblins to uh, essentially wipe out the local population and, and take over. And the players were like, no, we're not going to really do that. And he's like, oh, okay, well, then I'm not going to lead you out. And he tried to turn the goblins on them before they escaped. And so one of the players uh, punched the guy in the face like he was wearing that plague doctor mask. If And if you know what that is, it's that long beak kind of thing. It's from the Middle Ages. And so he punched the thing and the mask came off and the goblins realized that this guy wasn't a monster and they thought that he was. Um, because of this costume, they kind of were like keeping their distance from him. And so they punched the mask off and, and the goblins saw who he was. And in that moment, there was just chaos all over the place and the players used that to run away. And one of the things that had happened was when they were visiting the plague doctor in his quarters where he lived in these caves, there was a map of the caves in there. And one of the players had looked at that map and kind of memorized where everything was so they knew where the exit was. So they were running toward the exit. And so that was where we ended, was like, you're on your way to the exit. So the second uh, part of the session, so session four, was going to be the actual escape from uh, the goblin caves. Okay, so one of the things that I did for that session, so I, first off, I grabbed some pictures. Again, these came off Pinterest. I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly where I got them from. I just searched for, you know, I think I might have even searched for something like Warhammer Plague Doctor. Uh, it might have been D&D &D Plague Doctor or Pathfinder. I don't know what my search terms were, but I got a you know, picture of what a Plague Doctor looked like. And then this is the guy without his costume. And uh, again, so these just came from, from Pinterest, but I, I had images of these so I could show the players. So... I had written down um, my chase rules, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second. And then I had, for my exit, I had all these different zones. So I watched a, a video by How to Be a Great GM and a, a video on chase scenes. And one of the things that he talks about in um, in his in that video is to divide your chase scenes into zones. And you have some zones that are fast and some that are slow. And I kind of like that idea. And another thing that I incorporated, which I just talked about, uh, was a different mechanic for doing chase scenes. So I'll just talk about that now. So this came out of this book. This is the Neverland uh, fantasy role-playing setting. Now, it's created for 5e, technically, but there's so much in this book that can be used in a, any fantasy adventure game, regardless of system. And a lot of folks in the old school D, D community, they kind of consider this to be the most old school of the 5e settings that's kind of been published. You know, this is not published by by Watsi. It's it's a different company. But one of the things that's really cool uh, in this book, so this is Neverland, like, you know, um, Peter Pan, but there's a chase mechanic in here. 
and it involves playing rock, paper, scissors, which I just, I read that. And I was like, this is brilliant. And so basically the idea is that um, every, you, every player, uh, you know, goes and makes, or each side does uh, rock, paper, scissors and rock is attack. Paper is evade. And then I think uh, scissors are sprint or it might be vice versa, but it doesn't matter. So that's the idea. And so what you can do is, uh, first set the parameters. And so you have to decide how many wins do you need to get in rock, paper, scissors for your site to escape before the side that's chasing you gets a certain number. And so what I said was that the players needed to get um, five wins before I got on behalf of the goblins before I got four wins. And that was making it a little bit easier for me. But the idea was that they were being chased by a ton of goblins and they didn't really know their way. So I was trying to kind of include that in in those numbers right so if they end up losing that means they're going to get caught up to and they're going to get captured so on your turn if you play an attack which is rock then you can take one attack or one uh, ranged missile fire and i'm going to be really quick the rules are a little bit more complicated than this but they're pretty easy um, to implement they're just complicated to explain uh, and then if you're trying to um, evade then you can um, make a skill check for certain things. And then if you're sprinting, um, then that's a different mechanic, right? So there were all these different things. It's all explained in this book. I, I highly recommend getting this book. It's super cheap. That's the other thing. It's it's gorgeous. And you get um, all these different ideas in here and encounter tables and random tables and maps and lovely illustrations. And you can get this on Amazon for really inexpensive. It might've been, it's like a hardback book. And I think it's like maybe $25. It's Yeah. See that? So you can probably even get it cheaper on Amazon than that. So highly recommend getting it to get those rules. And that's why I'm not really going into the details of how they work, because I, I don't want to give away um, the author's, you know, hard work for free on the channel here. But I did rock, paper, scissors like that. And again, it was so much fun because I was going up to each player and I, I did round robin. So I had I made sure each one of them got to play uh, at least once. And uh, I just went up to them and um, I didn't really give them time to think. I'd say like, okay, you know, you're the, the player's name. I'd say, okay, so-and-so you're up, rock, paper, scissors, go. And they would get so freaked out. They'd be like, what? what's happening? And, and so they would do it. And then like, you know, all the players are encouraging them on and they would be so scared, like what's going to happen if they lost. And um, it was so much fun. And as it came down to it, they ended. So what I did was have them play once for each of these zones that we went into. I had eight zones. And I figured that would be enough to get at least five wins or for me to get four wins. And as it turned out, it was. Um, and uh, they barely made it out. I think on the last turn, um, they got their fifth win. And had they lost, I would have gotten my fourth. And it would have worked out that way. I think I remember this is a few years ago. But um they uh they they loved it they were just like oh my god that was so much fun because it was like again really putting that pressure on going directly up to the player and interacting them with them to play that so much more fun than just rolling dice to see if you advanced your miniature along the grid right it was just like this was so much more immersive and interactive and they really felt the anxiety and the stress of being chased by stuff okay and then what i had was like each one of these zones i had different things in here i had goblins that would appear in the zone and there, um, this one, there was like a spider web that was was there that they could get caught in. Now, this is something I ended up taking out later. I kept it in here, but my daughter afterwards, uh, again, talking about that kind of session zero thing, I should have remembered this is on me. So I thought she was okay with webs as long as there was no actual spiders, but she kind of said no. Um, that was really freaking her out. And so I've not used this again, but at the time I did use it. But I had different things that you had to do. So they had to make a strength check. So in addition to doing the rock, paper, scissors, the player who did the rock, paper, scissors also had to make some kind of ability score check to get out of um, that particular situation. So here I had uh, the ghost, uh, ghost of a mighty forest. So it was sort of like a ghost forest that was in here. And then I had... Um, 
this ancient dwarven mine. And this was important because uh, the cleric player saw Moonstone in this dwarven mine. And so one of the things that he realizes is that the dwarves were mining that, but that meant that this was a source of that. And he decided that he belonged to a church. He'd kind of made this up that um, collected Moonstone. And so he was trying to grab pieces of it on the way out because it was important to his faith. It was sort of like finding a holy relic. And so I had put that in there for him and they they went through this. And so uh, he grabbed some of that, which was going to be important later. Uh, and then uh, I had this part where it was just, comp- uh, let's see, I think it was just super dark. Oh, no, this is a shortcut. I had this was a shortcut. So they had to make a wisdom check to find the shortcut, which meant that they uh, would get um, a bonus when they did their rock, paper, scissors. Next time, like I'd let them go twice just in case they lost or something like that. I, I figured exactly how I did it. But I was trying to give them little little bonuses, little tricks, which reminds me, I'm going to go back and talk about what I would have done if they'd drawn um, a uh, when they were going through the case, if they'd drawn a joker. But uh, really quick, going back to this. So uh, this one, I had um, a rat that whispered to them and said, don't breathe the mushroom spores. Okay, and so one of the things that I did when I started this game for my daughter was I went onto my social media networks and I asked all of my followers or friends, uh, give me ideas to help me make my game weird. I wanna do this sort of, I've talked about this before, but I tend to do very much like grounded medieval fantasy. And I wanted to really push the brownies for my daughter's game to really kind of explore just being fantastical and more magical than I usually am. And I wanted some inspiration. So I asked people for ideas on making things weird. And one of the things that came up, and I know it seems simple, but it was this idea of like animals that talk, but only in specific situations, or maybe only one character can hear them or something like that. And it's not like cutesy, it's like creepy almost. And so I had this rat approach one of the players and only one player heard the rat, but it whispered to them and said, don't breathe the hallucinogenic mushroom spores. And then it just like scurried away. And it's never happened again with that character. And um, so they were kind of freaked out about that. And so I talked about how I had those um, um, hallucinogenic effects. I had a whole table like a, what used to be in the front of my book here, but um, I had a whole table of hallucinogenic effects that could happen. And that was something else they really loved um, interacting with because it, um, I would pass them a note. Like if, if they failed their check, uh, I would give them a little note and say like, this is how your character feels now. Like, and again, I'm not trying to tell them how they feel, but like they were being affected. So this is what's happening. And it, w- and it would be something like, you've just noticed that um, so-and-so's hair is, is like really, really um, pretty or something like that. And like you you want to get close to it and, and smell. And I know it could sound a little creepy. I wouldn't do that with certain players because it could be very awkward. Um, I definitely wouldn't have had the dad player do that to another girl player. But between the the young lady players, the, my daughter and her friends, like they thought that was hilarious, right? So they were like getting close. They were sniffing each other without explaining why they're doing it, right? Nobody knows what's going on. All of a sudden, one is just kind of leaning close and like smelling someone's hair. Again, I know that that, that could be crossing a line. So I'm not recommending this for every game. You have to know your players. Uh, in my particular case, I had asked them ahead of time, like, hey, some stuff's going to happen. Are you guys OK with sort of play acting a little bit where you have to physically interact with each other? And they were like, yeah, we can do that. And we'll let you know if we're not cool with that. And I said, great. So um, they did have the option to say, hey, I'm not comfortable doing that. But none of them said that. Right. So um, I would definitely take in their their um, their ideas and and their feelings into consideration for that. So. Uh, they had a lot of fun with that. Like one of them was pretending that like they could see creatures running around. One of them had to pretend that like um, they were huge and everybody else was really tiny. And uh, so it it just, the way that they play acted, that was just a lot of fun. But um, that was the hallucinogenic mushroom area. And then there was a bridge where they had to make a dex check to get across. And then they finally made their way out. Okay, so that was kind of the end of that session. Um, And then I had sort of like what happened when they came out, their eyes took a while to adjust. They had to find food because they hadn't eaten forever. They had to find food and water. And so I had some notes here on how they needed to like look for that, find a trail, get back to the main road and then find food and water. And then along the way, they they interacted with this person. They encountered this guy uh, who was the... Uh, he's part of like a merchant uh, guild kind of thing. And he was in an overturned coach uh, once again that had been attacked. And um, he basically hired them to uh, escort him back to the keep 
which is the keep on the borderlands. So that's how they ended up getting involved in, in the in the keep. So that was sort of that session. Let me go back really quick and address uh, when we were dealing with the cards for the different caves and the goblin caves. And I, I apologize for kind of doing this out of order. I hope this isn't too haphazard when you listen to it. But I put that joker in there so that if they needed to uh, draw that card, they might get like a little boon or something. And so things that I could have done would be uh, maybe they find some phosphorescent mushrooms so that they can light their way. Um, That could have been one. Uh, Maybe they find uh, a guide, another escaped prisoner who's been living there kind of feeding off rats and and other grubs and things like that and knows the way out, but was afraid to go and could lead them out. So different things like that, that would come up relevant to the situation that they were in. So that's why I didn't make a table. I kind of wanted to just make it up on the fly based on the circumstances at the time. So as, as I said, it never actually came up because they never drew a joker as we were doing that. But um, that was basically this particular session. So a couple of things, if you want to see uh, the list of kind of like the weird fantasy tropes that I collected from all of my social media, I actually wrote a blog post about it and I listed them. I'll put a link to that blog post below so that you can see, uh, you know, some of those different ideas and it might help inspire you and your campaigns to kind of do things a little bit differently. So also below, you're going to find links where you can join me on my social media networks, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, places like that, and also where you can buy something from my shop to help support my channel. So the biggest ways that you can help support my channel right now, first off would be please like this video. So my campaign prep videos always perform worse than my history videos, but I do wanna make these because there's a sizable portion of the audience who wants to see this. So I wanna continue and also I have fun making these. I love making these videos. So. Uh, I would encourage you to please like the video, to please subscribe to my channel if you have not done so already, to make sure that you don't miss um, any of my videos when I upload them. Coming up, there's going to be a 5,000 subscriber giveaway that I'll be getting to pretty soon, probably before the end of September, so you're not going to want to miss that. So make sure to subscribe. And then if you could buy something from my shop, that helps support my channel. T-shirt, mug, hoodie, poster, anything that you want uh, in a um, design that you want, and you can only find those designs at my shop. Coming up next, there will be another history video. Uh, I'm not going to reveal the topic yet because I want it to be a surprise when it hits. But with that, I'd like to say thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, happy gaming, and I will talk to you next time. And now it's time for the bonus content. So what I was drinking, what I was listening to, I worked on this video. So to be honest, in this one, I didn't take a lot of notes. Uh, This was really, if you couldn't tell, off the cuff as I was talking. Uh, I just really love running that game for my daughter. So I found it a little bit easier to just kind of look at my notes. But I I did go through my notebooks beforehand just to refresh my memory as to what those particular sessions was about. I had to dig out that pack of cards, uh, pull a book off my shelf. So uh, while I was kind of doing that and thinking about it, I had a little bit of this. This is Ardbeg. So this is Isla Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. I apologize, it's a little dark. So I record with natural light and uh, with the days getting shorter now, I'm running out of light rapidly. But uh, Isla Single Malt Scotch. I had an Isla Scotch in one of my other videos um, that was uh, Lafroy, And this is another one. Again, it's a little smoky, but uh, I just had a tiny little bit, what uh, we would refer to as a wee dram. So I had a wee dram of uh, Ardbeg Isla Scotch. And then uh, listening to Miles Davis at Carnegie Hall. So uh, I got this at my friend's record shop. He owns a record shop in Burbank called Run Out Groove, Burbank, California. And uh, this is a classic concert recorded in May of 1961. So it's Miles, but I mean, just classic support Hank Mobley. He's got Wynton Kelly on piano, Paul Chambers on bass, Jimmy Cobb on drums. That, that section right there, the Wynton Kelly trio, classic Uh, rhythm section for so many jazz albums made in the, uh, especially in the sixties. So, and then he's got Gil Evans, who was the arranger who did so many classic Miles albums like Sketches of Spain. He did um, Porgy and Bess and uh, uh, many other ones. So Gil Evans arranging with the 21 piece orchestra. So this is just a fantastic album. I've had it on my list for a long time. My friend got one in and uh, I asked if he could hold it for me, uh, which he did. So um, this was uh, an awesome addition. So uh, again, thank you so much for watching and I will talk to you next time.